I'm trying ketamine therapy for the first time today. Ta-da! As most of you know, unless you're new here, I live with chronic pain, a neuropathic condition, and I've also obviously struggled with mental health, anxiety, panic, and depression. I wrote a whole book about it. That's like my baseline. But I'm really excited to try ketamine infusion psycho-assisted therapy. I am doing my ketamine injection today at Field Trip Health, which is located in Santa Monica. It is a ketamine infusion clinic, which means they are there to support you through your entire journey. They have a nurse practitioner who does all your medical evals. Then you have a psychotherapist who does the actual trip with you. And then you go home. From what I've been told, it is really doing wonders for people in not only the depression and PTSD, realm but also people with neuropathic and other chronic pain issues basically ketamine is a let me see if I can get this word right disassociative anesthetic so a lot of people think ketamine is like a club drug or even a horse tranquilizer but a lot of people don't know that ketamine actually got its start in the medical field as an anesthetic so people getting anesthesia or having pain but it also had this disassociative effect and they found when you paired that with therapy it was resetting neural circuitry in a way that was really helping people recover Something that is different about ketamine from most psychedelics is that it's actually been shown that ketamine can reconnect and connect neurons. So if you've been stuck in a patterned way of thinking or feeling, ketamine can actually refire and reconnect new ways of thinking and doing things. That's why it's really good for people with treatment resistant depression. I found out about Field Trip Health after going to a psychedelics conference in Vegas last year. I did a vlog about that and I asked a question about doing psychedelics for chronic pain and a bunch of the scientists there recommended I actually start with ketamine first because ketamine is a anesthetic which means it is also supposed to help block with pain. So that's where I started doing all of my research and and it turns out it is legal everywhere. You can find ketamine clinics probably in your area. You might have to drive to a more well-known city or place that does it, but sometimes if it's done in a hospital, insurance can help with the cost. I unfortunately am not getting it done covered by insurance, so I'm doing it at Field Trip Health, and the first cost is $750, which includes not only your trip session or your journey as they call it, but also two therapeutic appointments prior and one integration session after. So I have gone over two hours with my psychotherapist already, who's gonna be with me in the room today, to go through what are my intentions, what are my goals with this, and then she has given me every single detail about what to expect with doing ketamine. Everything from what happens when I walk in the door, how I will be set up, how long the nurse will stay with me, how they're gonna pick which arm they do to the actual trip itself to lift off, as they say, and how coming back in feels and all the juicy good <laughs> I'm weirdly not scared at all I am someone who is typically terrified of doing psychedelics I've never been able to successfully take psychedelics and I've definitely never done ketamine I have done enough research and know that environment has been the biggest factor in contributing to quote unquote bad trips, but I've also learned that there's no such thing as a bad trip. The trip gives you what you need, maybe not what you want. So environment plays a huge role in your fear about doing it. And my psychotherapist has said this over and over again, every single person comes back. <laughs> you don't get lost forever, you're not gone. You always come back. As soon as they stop the medicine, you're done tripping with some like haziness coming out of it. I know that this is only my first session and they typically recommend between one and six sessions for your first dosing journeys because some people only need one session and it feels like it's done wonders for them. It's really about getting it done back to back so not letting too much time go in between each session is where they find it has like the most effect. So unfortunately I'm not going to be filming the actual trip because I want to be 
present for that. I really want to be in my body and my intention and mantra going into this is nothing to fear, no thing to fear, and I am safe. The feelings of chronic pain have a lot of fear driving it. So I would like to be super present in that moment. So I will bring you guys a little bit along with me and then obviously we'll debrief after. So see you on the other side. I am in the ocean room. Vibes. My call button. Blankies. Zero gravity chair. Very comfy. When we walked in, a guy was coming out and he just goes. <sighs> I was like, guess that's a good sign. I'm dying because <laughs> I'm trying to imagine you just jump cutting directly to me being like, okay, see you on the other side. And then I'm just, I look like this. <laughs> okay, but like I was in the jacuzzi and my hair dried a crazy way. So it's Sunday, two days post first ketamine infusion. And I am so, like, where do I start? Okay, so as you guys saw, you saw me go in to that gorgeous room. I wanna say everything done by Field Trip, the company, was perfect. And here was a really exciting part. I thought this was an IV. I don't know why, whenever they said intramuscular, I thought it was in, I don't know, but it's a shot. Normal Kelsey in that environment would have been like, Oh my God, wait, like they're telling me this like five seconds before they're about to do it because I had been confused. They were like, okay, you ready for the shot? And I was like, a shot? I thought this was a IV thing. But new Kelsey and safe Kelsey in that environment felt like I'm here, I feel safe, I am prepared. I will say my arm is very sore, but that'll go away. The nurse came in and took all my vitals. My psychotherapist came in and we went over my intentions. She gave me some flight instructions, which was basically like, here's what to expect. Here's how the process is gonna go. And then she said, okay, are we ready? And the nurse came in and I was so nervous. My hands and feet were like pouring buckets. I was so nervous. It was the first time I was going to be successfully doing psychedelics because every other time I've tried, my SSRIs were like, eh, no block, can't help you here. And I had my eye shades and my headphones ready to go on. And my psychotherapist was reading a poem by Maria Sabina before I went in about trusting yourself and trusting that nothing I come across is something I can't handle. And to trust the medicine, to trust myself and to lean into anything. If something was joyous, lean into it. If something was difficult or uncomfortable to lean into it. And just like hearing these little reminders and going over my intention of nothing to fear. By the time she finished reading the poem, usually people started to kind of like feel something. And she finished the poem and I was like, I'm pretty sure I still feel pretty sober. And then the part that I was most fearful of, like the takeoff was so smooth. The part of like going into the world was gorgeous. I kept saying gorgeous over and over again. And I started to feel kind of like how I feel on laughing gas where things start to feel like floaty. As soon as I was feeling the high, I wanted to talk. I couldn't believe people didn't talk on ketamine. Like I immediately was like, I need to speak everything that is happening in my mind, what's happening in my body. Like I took my eye shades and my headphones off. I'm not gonna say that was mistake number one. People do ketamine without eye shades and headphones literally all the time. But I think I had been so sure how the process was gonna go where you put headphones and eye shades on and you lay there for an hour, hour and a half. That was what I was so sure was going to happen. Like looking back on it, I'm dealing with like the self shame of I didn't do it right. You know, spoiler alert, um, things got saucy. I can remember everything and I wrote things down in my journal. I knew exactly what I was talking about the whole time. I mean, it didn't make sense, but I could very clearly remember everything. The first thing that popped up was the image of my childhood dog, Patch. She was a Dalmatian. Parents got her as our family dog when I was a baby and she grew up with me and she lived to be like 
15 or 16, I think. And my imagery of her was just so vivid and strong and she just kept coming back up. And I remember like she was like an inside outside dog, but mostly outside dog because she loved the patio and the sun. I just kept like seeing her through this sliding glass door that we had, which I later realized was I was probably looking at Patch as like a version of my inner self or like my past childhood. And I felt like a mixture of so much love and then also sadness for her in her later years because she did have like really bad hip dysplasia and she had like some tumors, like non-invasive tumors on her, but we did have to put her down because of her pain. And while I had gone there with this idea of focusing on pain, my pain was not a part of my journey at all. It was all mental health stuff, which, you know, my therapist had said something really funny. Like we bring these buckets of our life to the healing that we're like, okay, we know that this exists in our life. We know this exists in our life, but like, I'm here to focus on this thing. But then these other buckets, buckets get invited to the party. And then when they show up, we're like, how dare that showed up. I was here to focus on this thing. And here came this other bucket. And the mental health bucket was like a big thing. Not necessarily in the moment, I wasn't thinking about my anxiety and panic or depression. So the middle part was really like, I was crying happy tears and I just kept saying how gorgeous everything is and talking and like, I'd throw in these stories about my life. Like I was just so talkative and my psychotherapist did such a good job of like yes anding everything like nothing was like trying to redirect like everything I asked she was like you're doing everything perfectly everything is exactly how it's supposed to be like yes and that felt really good to have someone there like that I'm going through this like middle gorgeous period where I'm laughing and I'm crying and I think that's when things kind of started to go a little south so about 10 minutes in, I'm feeling so giggly and laughy, but I, I'm so aware of everything and I'm so aware of like who I am and where I am. And they ask if I want the booster shot and the booster is basically like doubling the mini dose. So it's like you get a mini dose and then you get another mini dose so that you get a full dose. I know that I shouldn't be this aware of things if I'm on ketamine and doing a therapeutic session. So yes, I'll take the booster. So she comes in and she does the booster, smooth sailing, no problem. So I'm like, you know, fine. I remember like having these moments of like sober clarity. Like I felt like I was sober, but I knew I wasn't. Like at one point I thought my hand was moving like this and it wasn't. And I was like, okay, so I know I'm not like back, but I kept being able to say things like, I know I'm in Santa Monica at the ketamine clinic. I know I'm Kelsey. I know your names. And like, I kept saying things that I think my brain was trying to bring my consciousness back to reality. And this is where things started to like go a little south. And this is why I, I say like, I'm not sure if I did it right because I didn't have my eye shades and headphones on the whole time. Even though I, I like went in and out of closing my eyes. But when I would open my eyes, my ego, my like logical self was like, you're in reality, like come back to reality and act like you're in reality. And my brain and chemicals were like, we are not here. Your consciousness is expanding. We are not able to do that. And my brain was like, well, no, come back. And my body was like, no thanks. And so I remember asking like, how long has it been? And she said about like 30 to 40 minutes. So I remember thinking it's only been 40 minutes and I still have like 40 minutes to go and I feel so sober. And I started to wonder if I had it up or something. I remember again, like my brain was trying to grasp onto any normalness. And at the very end, after everything, my therapist and the nurse had said like, I don't know anyone who hasn't like taken off their eyeglasses and headphones and been like, what the f is going on? Because your consciousness isn't here in your body and you're trying to be normal. And so she said, that's why she thinks, spoiler alert, drum roll please, I did start to have a panic attack. So about 40 to 50 minutes in, which with the booster, I was supposed to have had this journey for at least 90 minutes. I start to feel uncomfortable. Again, my brain was trying to reach for normalcy. 
I'm like starting to sweat. So I'm like, can I take my jacket off? So I, I'm like stripping, I'm like pulling the sleeves down. I literally, if she would have let me, I would have taken off my pants and shirt. I was just sweating and I'm like, can I get on the floor? And she's like, oh, normally, you know, the first session we like people to stay in the chair, but you seem very like confident and sure, like sure. So I get on the floor and she gets on the floor. And I think once I got on the floor, I was like, I would like to be normal and I couldn't be normal. So I said, I think I'd like to call my boyfriend. And she's like, okay, yeah, like, let's do that if you want, you know, maybe, you know, I couldn't even remember, but I was like, I'm going to call my boyfriend. So I get out my phone. I don't even know how I'm able to see because like your vision is like, and I FaceTime Jared and he picks up and I'm like, hi, I think I need you to come here. I'm just having a little anxiety and I think it would be best if you come. And he's like, okay, I'm on my way. And then I'm like, yeah, that wasn't good enough. That didn't like help my anxiety. So I need to FaceTime my parents, my mom. <laughs> and my therapist is like, okay, are they people that will, would they, do they know you're on ketamine and they understand? The, and I'm like, yeah, they're very liberal. They're fine. It's very, very simple. Like they, they don't care. And so I FaceTime my mom. My mom picks up and I guess she thought I was like done with it. She didn't know I was like in the middle of it. She's like, hey. And I was like, hey mom. I'm doing a academy session right now and I'm just panicking a little bit and you know so she realizes and she goes and sits next to my dad on the couch and I see both of them and I'm like oh hey guys like oh I just I love you guys mom and I'm like crying and I'm like I saw Patch our dog and they're like oh nice and my dad's like you know Kelsey just remember everything you're feeling right now is temporary it's just temporary and I think in that moment no one knew how to get to that place of reminding me about the temporariness of this all like i would have had to been able to talk to myself about that and i was telling the therapist i was like you did a great job but like there was no way that i was gonna calm down with anyone's suggestions because i needed to know that how to self-soothe myself into like knowing it was okay to still journey a little bit for like another half hour or so you're starting to come back into your body and this is where we started to realize that like the landing for me happened a lot sooner than most people with the drug because I had a very high tolerance. So I started to land my airplane while I was still not in this hemisphere. That is what was causing my anxiety. It was like the landing was very rocky and I was like on the floor and I'm sweating and I'm drinking water and I'm just like, everything was confusing. And then Jared showed up and it was like the soft blanket and they gave us a little bit of time alone and I laid on the floor with Jared and at this point I knew I was starting to like come back and sober up and that fear feeling really was so apparent to me and it wasn't even so much the fear of like being stuck but it was the fear of the life that I had known was potentially over and in hindsight that's really gorgeous because of like my depression and anxiety and panic I still love this life and I don't want it to be over. You know, I didn't want it to end. After like decompressing for a couple days, I realized that that's so beautiful, that like as much as I struggle, it needed to be another thing that I could add to my Rolodex too of panicking that if I got through the scariest thing, my biggest fear, which was doing psychedelics and being gone forever and lost forever, if I had a panic attack and now I'm still fine, that was like the biggest <laughs> takeaway was like that needed to happen. I needed to be confronted with that panic attack to know that I still would be okay. And there really is nothing to fear. So to kind of like wrap this up, I sat there for a while, probably like another 30 minutes with Jared and the nurse came in and checked on me and gave me snacks and water. And like, I started to come back and it really is like kind of waking up out of surgery. Like things aren't normal, normal. You were more here in this realm than another realm. And so we had that debriefing and, and I knew that like I needed to work on that part of the shame of like not doing it right because it went exactly the way it needed to be. And I just felt very open and loving. And they told us that the next 24 to 48 hours, your brain is very neuroplastic and to develop like good habits, like don't consume traumatic media, don't like get into deep conversation that I couldn't handle, like keep things gorgeous and beautiful. We did and I slept really well that night. And then Saturday was like just such a beautiful day. We got up and we went to the park and we hung out at the park and played games. And we went and saw a movie and we had dinner together and it was just like 
it was the perfect decompression day. And now today being Sunday, you know, and being able to look back on like all the notes I had written down, I'm just like, I'm just understanding so much. When I first got out of it, I was like, I don't think I'm gonna do this again because I was still in the panic. But the truth is now that I'm looking at it, I feel more equipped and curious about doing it again. And I might consider that. And as for my pain, <laughs> my pain feels exactly the same. Yesterday, you know, was feeling tinges and pings and things like that, but that's okay because there was so much other stuff that I think needed to be addressed first with the ketamine that I'm, I'm okay with the pain being the same. I'm not devastated. I'm not like losing hope. I'm, I don't think it's a failure. I really can't get over my hair, you guys. I'm so sorry. <gasps> if you have any questions, leave them below and I will try to answer them potentially in the comments or as a part two. And yeah. Okay. Signing off. <laughs>